the companions to famous monsters of film land. They were so dynamic that other artists felt they had to try to live up to his standards, but uh, no one has really ever reached the, the elevation of Frank Frazetta. Imagine, just imagine, once you see what Frank was able to do, what was hidden for all those years. Oh, terrible, in a way, terrible. But not so terrible that it didn't finally happen. Bam! Came out. Total explosion. Dracula and then the yeah. werewolf, and then yeah, it was traditional stuff. You know, the monster, right. and then the the, right. the ape, and then there was this, and then all and of a sudden there was that sea witch. And, Where'd she and, come from? And right. after and that, the, the wing terror thing girl. of yes. the guy yeah. fighting off the pterodactyl. Right, thing. absolutely Man. terrific. Up until that time, everything had to be so thoroughly enmeshed in uh, Roman or Greek uh, culture, and Frank did something completely different with that cover, and it made me, made me want to look for other works by him. Even though, as Bernie said, he, he wasn't really all that keen on horror as a subject, he, sh he showed us nightmares and horrors that we never, ever imagined as kids exactly. that just scared the Jesus out of us. Oh, mm -hmm. those covers, they're just, they're classics. When I first saw Frank Frazetta's work was, was back in the early 60s, and I was working on a book on the history of American illustration, and I was considering a lot of different artists for inclusion in it. And uh, Frank was still too early in his career at that point, and by the time I had a chance to do a second revised edition of the book in the 80s, uh, I was certain to include him. Up until the time that Frank uh, started making uh, a condition of his commissions, the return of his originals, artists didn't get their artwork back. It belonged to the publishers. It was the Frazettas that changed it for the best for everyone. One thing I knew, I knew enough to keep my paintings. That I knew. And the, for that alone, that, that, that makes you rich if you want. If you want to get rich, you got rich. The first Frazetta sketches were placed on the market in the early 1970s. They sold for $35. Now, a great Frazetta sketch will sell for $10,000. His watercolors have sold for up to $50,000. His oil paintings have sold for up to $250,000. But that gives you an idea of the scale. As the art market has gone up and down, the price for Frazetta originals has continuously gone up. By me, me saving, and it's the originals. Oh boy, that's worth the fortune. Well, we didn't think about it in those days. You know, that was the, the thing. You know, who thought that the originals would be worth anything? If I had thought that my original would be worth something, I would have said, hey, I want them back. I was there with De Laurentiis through hundreds of thousands of oh, dollars yeah. at Frank yeah. to buy Catgirl, and Frank turned them down. You should have seen his face. He went yeah. apoplectic. Yeah. Dino wanted Frank's Catgirl through hundreds of thousands of dollars at Frank, and Frank said, no, I like picture. I like picture. One to tie into another, you know, I like pictures. <laughs> By the time he'd established himself, he could have been painting anything. He could have been painting abstract art. He could have been painting illustrative art and been showing in galleries and gone the fine art route. He stayed with um, what we call commercial art because he chose to. And I absolutely believe that his work transcends the genre. For me, Frank's Conan is the definitive Conan. I, I don't think it can ever be topped. Uh, it's just such a purely visceral vision. Conan was written in the 30s. Uh, the books were published in the 30s. They were republished in the 40s. They were republished in the 50s. There was always a cult audience for Conan. And then Frazetta publishes a series of paperback covers in the 60s. All of a sudden, millions of copies of a paperback book sell for the first time in history. When he started to do those Conan covers, it was as though everything in his life uh, just blossomed, just immediately. As a, you had a full-blown, classical, wonderfully drawing illustrator who seemed to come out of nowhere. I read a lot of different Ari Howard. I read uh, uh, Brad McMorn and uh, uh, Cull, as well as Conan. You know, I'd sort of pick him by the Frazetta cover. <laughs> Roy Thomas sent me a batch of the paperbacks, and I saw these Frazetta paintings. That's the first time I was exposed to this stuff, and I was floored. 
That's it. He was the ultimate Conan painter. This is symbolic of death, you know, it's always somebody dying. Yeah. So you don't see anybody dead there. Over there, he's he's been creating man, you know, he's, he's just doing his job. And he's he's killed a few guys and has he's about to kill a few guys. Well we always wanted to get the kind of the mood and the lighting and the feel of those things. And, and there's a couple of scenes that are just absolutely dedicated in the movie to Frazetta, uh, the scene we call the orgy chamber, when Conan comes back to get revenge. And that whole scene is, is done as much like Frazetta as it can be. It's, you know, from Thalsa Doom turning into a snake with a princess laying next to him, to the girl chained to the pillar. The whole fight that takes place. But none of them thought of calling Frank and and asking him how he felt about various things or hiring him. I mean, if I was Milius, I would have hired Frazetta in 10 seconds. That was the, the first, you know, immediately I said, well, we've got to get Frazetta. And Dino said that he had tried to get Frazetta and that Frazetta didn't want to be bothered and didn't want to do this. And knew we, you know, approved that we were making Conan, but didn't want to do anything. Every time that we tried to do anything of approaching Frazetta, it was sort of stopped by Dino. I've, I've never seen Frosity painted so well as in uh, Conan and the Red Cape yes. on the back of the eight. That ape. young body, that young, all that thing, everything's the just saying right whack. But I'll never forget the moment I saw the first Conan cover. I was in a drugstore in Thousand Oaks, I was in high school, and I was looking at the paperback racks because I was always looking for Frazetta's cover, and there was Conan the Adventurer, and it was like, hit me like a ton of bricks. When you look at the face, for example, of Conan the Adventurer, the great Conan painting where he's leaning on the sword, what you're looking at is not just a picture of some little fantasy character, you're looking at the picture of the 20th century. The evil that's coming out of the earth, going up the sword, emanating and resonating from the face. And beyond that, he's not only drawing the picture of the 20th century, but he's drawing the picture of the darker side of human nature. Even look at things like, like you know, the scars on Conan's arms. It's these scars, these cuts were made when his arm was up to, to ward off a blow. The sword and the heap of skulls and hands and things and this girl curled at his feet. It's all there. It never gets better than that. Here you get Conan, the way he is. That's it. Anything else? Let's just copy. would not we'll do any good. I'm sure you've seen a few of those around. Huh? If, if you were to ask him what he is, he wouldn't say he's an artist. He would say he's a sportsman. He's a photographer, he's a bowler, he's a golfer, he's a family man. I mean, his primary interest is living life. And because of that, that's what makes him a great artist. He values his physical skills as, as an athlete more than he does his skills as an artist. He knew the vocabulary of muscles, how muscles worked. So I think Frank's knowledge of athleticism, that all fed into his artwork because physically he understands that. So if he says no, an artist is the worst judge of himself anyhow. An artist, most artists don't know what make him tick. They're always thinking of something else. He took karate up and he had the black belt scared to death. Of we had a big sandbag, I don't know what they weighed, 75 pounds, hanging from the front porch where it was now, the old style, hanging from a big steel metal hook. And my friends and I being teens, we'd pound it, pound it, bing, bing, bing. My dad's like, what the hell's wrong with you? You're not hitting it right. You gotta drive those hips and that. Let me see, Papa. One shot, honest to God, he snapped the hook right out of the beam. And the punching bag went about 10 feet under the lawn. It's like, God damn it, Pop, thanks a lot for ruining the hook. And that's not, he's just unbelievable. His mind, mind over matter. If he put his mind to it, you weren't gonna stop him. You know, he's like Gary Cooper or something. It's like, don't push me around. If you push me one more time, I'll kill you. And then you do, you know, so. But he gives you a chance not to push him around. But he'll deny it. I always let them start it. Every time, there was just some guy picking on me, bigger than me, and saying, hey, hey, wise guy. That's all. That's all, brother. I just, I had to be a, an athlete. 
and I, I had to play ball. I had to throw a ball. And I was just joining the, the ball team, and the guys were all throwing a baseball all the way to right center. They couldn't reach the bottom fence. They were all good. They, they had good arms. They couldn't reach the bottom fence. The bottom fence. They couldn't the reach. Fence. I said, look, I got to clean over that. And the te teacher heard me, and he handed me a brand new baseball. Here, help yourself. Throw it over the school. <laughs> boom, boom. I threw the ball. It disappeared. Completely disappeared. Went over the school, and they were staggered. That was the furthest anybody had ever seen a baseball go. Huh? 290 feet to the bottom. I was robbed. You guys are going to put down 400. The teachers, these, these floor was over 400 feet. You know, and of course the uh, New York Giants, when San Francisco Giants were in New York, wanted to, to uh, draft him at the time. They wanted to see me, the scouts, you know, and so on. And, and for two years they tried to get me. They was going to make me pitch in the big leagues and so on. There's no doubt in my mind that Frank could have played professional ball. It's that same drive. I mean, it's that, it, it, it all comes back to Frank's mind. Frank can pretty much do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. It's just that he doesn't want to do much. But, <laughs> but <laughs> that, that was the most important thing in my life, the ball. I must, I must say, uh, even more than the art, except later on, then it changed. Deep down inside, you wanted to draw your pictures. I, I, I know, but... Uh, oh, now you're thinking about it. Yeah, of course, now I'm thinking about it. You know, I didn't sign, and that's that. I wasted all the time in the world just goofing off. Really. All that time I could have been playing professional ball. And I, I just blew it. He has a cabinet full of cameras. He had 500 cameras. He was obsessed with cameras. One camera piled on top of another camera. So what that meant to me is that Frank has the eye of a camera. Everything he sees registers. That's why he loves cameras. But Frank mixes that with his fantasy, beautiful side. And when the two of them come together, you get a Frazetta. I have no idea why, I just fascinated by the cameras and the things they do. I, I have so many, I don't know what the hell to do. I'll have to burn them. And I remember uh, he was wearing a, a camera around his neck. And it, that struck me as odd. It was like he was a tourist or something like that. And I was thinking at the time that, um, you know, why would this guy have a camera around his neck? I mean, with what he has in his mind, what does he need to take pictures of? I'm, I'm a camera buff, that's all. It has nothing to do with my art at all. We were doing a John Wayne comic book, and he was helping me with that. And there's a scene where a rabbit shoots out of a bush or something like that in front of the horses. And I said, gee, I've never drawn a rabbit before. This here's the best single you got, young fellow? Yep. As you can see, the occupant has an unencumbered view of Route 41 and its palm sheltered beauty. What's more, that truck stopped across the way, Lots of quite nice there to go. A real tourist attraction, I'll wager. But if you would prefer to be away from the sound of passing traffic, there are other options, such as? Well, over on the other side of the building, we have rooms abutting on a quaint alley, allowed with fauna indigenous to the area, <laughs> or a permanently under repair parking lot. Perhaps you should be working for the local chamber of commerce. Unfortunately, Trader's Point isn't all that much into embracing the general public. Well, there's a sign outside of town that says this is a right friendly place. Edit that to read friendly to those who know it. <laughs> I get your meaning. No, this will do me just fine. Nothing like the rumble of 18 wheels to lull a man to sleep at night. And how long will you be staying with us? Can't say for certain. Depends on a lot of things. Why do you ask? Oh, simply a matter of economics. If you're going to be with us, say, for a week or so, it'd be much less expensive than $28.50 an hour rate. How quote did you assign it? How much cheaper? 10%. Five and five, huh? I'll beg your pardon, sir? Uh, half for you and half for the house. My daddy always said a man has to look out for his best interest. Sounds like your daddy gave you a 
pop of rare. I'm going to do the figure for me. We've seen that. That will be 2850 times 7, which is, you know, that'll do me. Uh, if I'm over, we can settle up later. <laughs> There's legal tender, as you're going to find. No, no offense, just giving them the standard eyeball test. Recommended procedure for retailers at all stripes. I have my key now? Oh, certainly. Uh, just a reminder, management can't be responsible for any valuables not checked at the desk. Do you like to keep some of that money in the motel safe? <laughs> no, I've got me a watchdog. Watchdog? Uh -huh. I'm sorry, sir, but no animals or pets are allowed on the premises. Well, I'm not talking about an animal or a pet. I'm afraid I don't understand. Tears bad <laughs> That's my watchdog. You a law enforcement officer of some type? <laughs> Not hardly. No sheree. And you wouldn't be on on the run? No. Just being careful is all. I've got a permit, everything right to the jail. Bills around yet? Not yet, Mr. Conway. Send them along as soon as I get here. Yes, sir. Some real prosperous looking too, some local talent, are they? Oh, the gentleman I spoke to is Leonard Carmichael. He's on the town council. I don't know the other guy. Carmichael stays here? Oh, no. He just uses one of the rooms for a business meeting now and again. Business meeting, huh? Uh-huh. See, you're doing some heavy reading out by the front desk. One of those college types? Uh-huh. What school are you going to? Nothing formal right now. Correspondence courses mostly, until I get the necessary tuition money. Now what are you taking? Accounting courses mostly. And fixing the line of the folks' money, eh? I guess you could say that. Why don't I ask what line of work you're in, Mr. Bidwell, is it? Hey, so Bidwell's my full handle. I'm a broker. You connected with one of those New York stock exchanges? No, no. Not that kind of broker. I deal in grain and livestock futures. Just a farm boy doing what comes natural. Oh, uh, so is there any